Welcome to the first in a five-part series of Department of Energy webinars that are focused on essential topics that are shaping the future of the built environment. Now, since it's the start of a special series, because today is National Fresh Breath Day, I made sure to brush and use mouthwash. But since we're not in person, you'll just have to take my word for it. Tens of thousands of zero energy and zero energy ready homes have already been constructed. Extensive builder feedback suggests strong business advantages, while testimonials from homeowners all across the country demonstrate a vastly superior customer experience. And that doesn't even address the impressive societal benefits associated with a stronger economy, cleaner air, additional jobs, and significantly less peak power demand. Now, if you read Green Builder Magazine, you know there are a growing number of zero energy codes in states and cities. Maybe even more significantly, the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code is essentially equivalent to a zero energy ready home enclosure. Now, if you're a builder and you haven't secured a ticket on this train, well, you have a lot of catching up to do. The good news is that you can start with this session, which will show the key building blocks of a zero energy ready home and how to optimize them. The even better news is that an optimized zero energy ready home can cost the same or less than a minimum code home. Between the additional profit, customer satisfaction, market differentiation, and reduced customer service calls, what's not to like at that point? Today, we're welcoming back a guest that was here just a few months ago, and he had quite a debut. He obliterated the attendance record here, drawing over 440 attendees. We'll see if he can top that today. Now, who am I referring to? Well, that would be Sam Rashkin. He's still the chief architect at DOE's Building Technologies Office. He's also the author of the book titled Retooling the U.S. Housing Industry, How It Got Here, Why It's Broken, and How to Fix It. And that presents a comprehensive strategy for transforming the new home buyer consumer experience. Apart from this work, Sam has earned a national reputation for his work leading housing programs that have partnered with thousands of home builders and resulted in over 1 million certified high performance homes. During his 20 plus years as a licensed architect in California and New York, he specialized in energy efficient design and completed over 100 residential projects. He has served on the National Steering Committees for USGBC's Lead for Homes, NHB's Green Building Guidelines, EPA's Water Sense label, and also served on the development team for EPA's Indoor Air Plus label. Now we have a handful of sponsors for this webinar. I'll start off with TRAIN by TRAIN Technologies, a global climate innovator. They create comfortable, energy-efficient indoor environments for commercial and residential applications. TRAIN solutions optimize indoor environments with a broad portfolio of energy-efficient heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems, building and contracting services, parts support, and advanced controls. For more information, please visit www train, that's spelled T-R-A-N-E dot com, or www.traintechnologies.com. Our next sponsor is Goodman. Since 1982, Goodman Manufacturing has focused on helping millions of homeowners achieve reliable, high quality, and affordable indoor comfort with products that continue to be designed, engineered, and assembled in the United States. As a result, the Goodman brand has earned the loyalty and respect from thousands of local independent heating and cooling professionals across North America. Providing additional support for today's webinar is the Department of Energy, Team Zero, and EBA. I also need to let you know that this webinar will be eligible for AIA credit, and the certificates will be handled by SIPA, which is the Structural Insulated Panel Association. Make sure to get your pen or pencil ready because if you're looking to secure AIA credit, I'm going to give you some very pertinent information in just a moment. Everybody ready? Okay. You're going to want to send your name and AIA number to info, I-N-F-O, at S-I-P-S dot O-R-G. The course number is 203. And SIPA's AIA educational provider number is five zero one 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 two one one in case you missed it i'll put that email address in the chat box 
along with the course and provider number. Hey, speaking of typing and communication, I want to let you all know that you can submit questions for Sam. Just use the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. I'm going to review those questions and ask them to him during the Q&A time that we have set aside after his presentation. Sam, welcome back to the webinar series. Hey, thank you, Mike. We're going to get back to the chair, and it's so great to be back here. First thing I want to say is um, I'm so glad uh, so many of you are here today. I know it's uh, a lot of various choices you can make for content, and I'm really glad you came to this one. I also want to just say I hope you're all doing as well as you can. I know these are really crazy, extraordinary times, and it affects each of us in different ways to different degrees. And I, I really hope you're all doing well and staying healthy. And, and, and thanks again so much for being here. So we promised you getting to zero for lower costs. So this is really going to be in two parts. First, I want to talk about getting to zero, part one. And that's going to be a lot of content that we drive from our Zero Energy Ready Home program, where I reside at DOE. But when we, when we talk about really your opportunities to lower cost, I'm going to pull more from what I do apart from DOE with uh, retooling the US housing industry and a, and a new book called Housing 2.0. So we'll move along and first get you to zero, then we'll get you to lower cost. Okay, so I always like to lead with a why. So here's a why for zero as, as, as simple and uh, easy as I can make it. And you've heard these numbers, but again, putting them together, I, I think is pretty compelling. Buildings share about 40% or account for 40% of the total US energy use. And they account for 70% of the electric use in our country. And so almost two thirds of that electricity is generated by fossil fuel. Meanwhile, we account for about just over 4% of the world's population, but over 14% of the carbon emissions. So three and a half times the emissions relative to our population. There is no path to a risk managed future for climate, environment, our economy, and resilience that doesn't go through zero energy buildings. It is our future. It's already becoming part of the code structure, as Mike referenced. It's part of a growing number of programs and health issues that are being addressed. This is the future. It, there's no path but zero. So that's why. And the reality is you have a lot of options for zero. So if you bear with me a little bit, I want to just, again, uh, from last time, make sure we're clear about all of the options for how we can be part of zero. And before I can explain the options, there are four key factors that really drive how each option compares to one another. And uh, the four key factors are high performance, annual energy consumption, renewable energy, and embodied energy. And high performance is the usual suspects. It's building science, it's health and indoor air quality, it's water, conservation, grid interactive, and resilience, all those things create a high performance building. And the energy efficient component comes in the annual energy consumption. And it's the amount of electricity we use, and it can either be with fossil fuel, where there's a carbon consumption on site, or electricity without fossil fuel, so that we have all the energy in the building coming from the electric source. And that can be all renewable, or it can be a mix. And then on renewable energy, uh, we can insist on it being on site, or we can allow microgrids, utility offsets, lot, lots of ways that we can address renewable energy. And embodied energy is all about the. I had to leave another meeting. Hold on. <laughs> and embodied energy is all about the uh, a different part of the energy consumption. All the above three addresses the operational energy, embodied energy is the energy uh, for extracting resources, producing materials, transporting the materials, installing them, maintaining the materials, and then the end of life, what we do with those materials. So that's kind of the embodied energy that is on top of the operational energy. So those are the four factors. And so if we look at zero, it's kind of a journey to less and less and less carbon. We can start with a code minimum home, go to a high performance home, which usually is an above code home, zero ready, zero net energy, 
zero net carbon and net positive carbon, and that's the journey to a, uh, a, an increasingly lower carbon consumption. And then anywhere along the way, we can do all sorts of things to reduce the embodied energy. You know, the materials we select and the sources of the materials, all the things are embedded in keeping the embodied energy lower. And so with the code, looking at all these, we're gonna compare these four factors for each step along the way. Gray is high performance, green is annual energy consumption, light with fossil fuel, dark green without, yellow is renewable energy, and orange is embodied energy. So for a code home, we have basically some level of performance mandated by the codes, and there's also the amount that's enforced versus mandated, but we won't get into that. And then there's the energy consumption in green, usually with or without fossil fuel. Most codes don't require all electric or, or have a, uh, a mandate that way. There's no requirements in most codes for renewable. And then you have the embodied energy, which is uh, a lot less than the uh, operational energy of the building. If we go to high performance, we ratchet up the performance of the building. We reduce the annual energy consumption. Most above code programs don't require uh, all electric yet and you still don't have renewable energy, and then you have your uh, embodied energy, but now it's a lot more significant portion of the operational energy. And if we go to zero ready, what we're doing, we're picking a program where the performance gets ratcheted up even further, the energy consumption reduces even further, and it, this is, you always love the virtual content where you have background noises kick in. I'm waiting for the dog barking to come up next. But anyway, we reduce the energy use even further. We still don't require renewables in a zero ready program and we have embodied energy. Now it's even more than the, uh, it's even more than the energy use of the building. So now the body carbon is greater than the operational energy use. And if we go to zero net energy, now we introduce the renewable energy to offset the operational energy, and we still now have a body carbon being a big chunk of carbon that's left. So zero net carbon will switch to the dark green, so we're only using electric without fossil fuels on site, so we can, in fact, use all renewable energy sources to have a carbon neutral operational energy, but now we still have that carbon. That's a significant chunk, even greater. And now we can go to net positive carbon and produce more than we consume to start going, start addressing the embodied carbon. So that's the basic progress to less and less and less carbon. And embodied energy can be addressed anywhere along the way, like I said. Team Zero is setting up a gateway, a portal for everyone to go in and learn about these steps to find the myriad of programs available at each step along the way with direct links to both the programs and their resources. So we're real excited about this. For those of you that want to learn more about how to uh, demystify Zero, learn about the options, this website and uh, application should be on the market, I think, by uh, September, October, the latest. Okay, so if those are all the programs. What I want to do is make Zero really simple and explain there are basic building blocks no matter where you are on the path to zero, the certain things you have to do. Uh, starting with zero ready and up, these are the basic building blocks that should be part of any zero energy program. And the first building blocks are, you wanna optimize energy efficient performance. And the three ways you do that is, first, you do a rigorous en enclosure that's very airtight, very well insulated, uh, very high performance enclosure. Then you use a very energy efficient equipment and Lastly, all the components, the appliances and lighting, also energy efficient. So now you've reduced your energy use uh, substantially, you know, 50, 60% below the 2009 IECC, probably 40% below the 2012. You know, you're getting a big chunk of savings from uh, that, those building blocks. But when you make a more efficient enclosure, uh, what they don't really tell us about too much is that we also increase the risk in our buildings. We can do harm with a more efficient enclosure, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So to do no harm, we have to make 
sure we have building blocks for water protection, insured comfort, and indoor air quality. And the last thing we want to do is have all this going for us and have a building that's not ready to stand the test of time. So we want a future ready building. And we do that with solar ready construction. If solar is not already part of the building, we make sure we meet or exceed forthcoming codes. And more and more, we have to be responsive to the prevailing disaster risks in any location so that the building investment we make for such a uh, zero energy, high performance building can withstand the rigors of any event that might occur to a large extent. And that's the building blocks for a zero home, no matter where you are on any of those steps. So let's look more into those. So with uh, a high efficient enclosure, basically you're building a, a comprehensive thermal control system. You know, you have the air ceiling, you have the air barriers, you have advanced insulation and advanced windows. And each, along the way, each of those things has critical components. The air barriers with a thermal bypass checklist, many of you know about, and wind intrusion, or wind baffles at the eaves and attics. Insulation is about quality, quantity, and thermal bridging. And you know, so all these things have to be addressed. And we, when we go through, and a lot of us have been through the various training programs, we know there are about a half mile of cracks in buildings that still played some windows and, and doors. and there's uh, the where the drywall meets the top plate, access panels, sheathing joints, penetrations, there are geometry factors that have to be addressed, all the usual suspects. And the big challenge in construction with all this litany of, of air leakage opportunities is who owns the holes and who's going to be responsible. So that's the big challenge. And you know, the thermal bypass checklist is really well laid out in this uh, graphic from the Journal Light Construction. There's a lot to do to make sure that we are also not only sealing the home, but installing air barriers that make sure that the assemblies are six-sided assemblies to the maximum extent. So we're, we're trying to make sure we are comprehensive both in air sealing and air barriers, and there's lots to do in the home. On the air sealing side, the target we're trying to get to varies by program. <clears throat> From passive house, which is 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals, you have all sorts of other levels. Uh, the code levels are three to five in 2012 IECC. Energy Star varies uh, from three to six, depending where you are for version three. And Zero Ready, the program I work with, is right around half of the Energy Star requirements. However, my personal recommendation is you, you really should be at 1.5 air changes 50 almost anywhere you build in the country. It's not a hard target. We now have the skills and knowledge and, and infrastructure to do this. This is where we should be. Everyone should be one and a half ACH 50 or better, no matter where you build a home. And so how much insulation should we put in buildings? Well, that depends on where you are in the country. And what's of interest to me is to show you side by side uh, the codes driving the amount of insulation in our enclosures, uh, the national uh, IRC or IECC code map to the California map. And you know, it, it begs a question, you know, there are seven climate zones for the contiguous 48 states, and there are 16 for one state for California. Sometimes, you know, we just can get too crazy because we do what we can, not what we need to do. You don't need 16 climate zones in California. That's what's wrong with that picture. But California is very renowned now for the fact that it has a zero energy code. And what I want to show you is the actual insulation requirements for California compared to the IECC really aren't that much more rigorous or not, or in some cases less. <clears throat> the reality is that they're rigorous in a lot of places they don't have a lot of weather and where it is uh, more severe winter weather, they're actually less rigorous than the national code. So let me just show you. So if we go to the one of the warmest climates, climate zone two, the IEC, in the uh, IECC climate zone maps, and compare that to the uh, relevant uh, California climate zones, which are 14 and 15, you see basically you have the same window. You notice that the, it's, a, it's a little bit higher U value, but you can't get a 0.25 window that won't be roughly a 0.32 or 0.3 U value. So, uh, so that's the windows are roughly the same. The attic is pretty much the same. The big thing in California is they have this high performance attic where you have 
38 on the flat and 19 on the slope. There's a lot of insanity to that for me, the fact that you would insulate both the slopes and the flat. I won't go into too much about that. You could put a radiant barrier in R38, and that makes a little more sense to me, but roughly we, we're about the same attics. Uh, the big thing is they have a pretty rigorous wall for the climates as, uh, as moderate as 14 and 15. Floor is a little greater, but you see basically the codes aren't that much different. And call attention to 2021 IACC. That's the one that's getting, to my view, very much equivalent to a zero energy ready code. So then we go to a little more rigorous climate zone three. And again, I would submit the windows are roughly the same. You're not going to get a 0.25 that's really 0.40. It's going to be 0.3 or 0.32. So it's the same windows. Uh, the ceilings are roughly the same again. Uh, again, the difference is they have this. Occasionally, um, you have a radiant barrier as an additional requirement. Uh, and then the wall values are a little bit greater for the mild climates. And so you see roughly it's, it's the same. Uh, basements don't really occur in climate zone three. It's not even worth looking past these last three columns. And then we go to climate zone uh, four. We're starting to get a little bit of winter and there are enough, they, we overlap climate zone one and 16 in this case. And now you're starting to see that the 2021 is actually looking a lot more rigorous in California. And so, you know, the national code is in fact, maybe more rigorous enclosure than the California code. And when we get to climate zone five, where now you have significant winter and you have summer, again, I would say that the 2021 IECC, the windows are roughly the same. It's more rigorous attics, more rigorous walls, uh, floors are more rigorous. Uh, the big difference, you know, by the way, is the, the big one that comes out is this R60 attic. And don't forget, if you use a racial truss, which is a requirement of almost all the high performance home programs, this would drop down to effectively an R49. So don't get too scared when you see the 60. And lastly, in climate zone six, you, uh, you have a little bit of overlap with a sliver of, of zone 16. Again, it's more rigorous to go with the national code, particularly if you're using the latest 2021, but even the 2018 to 2015 are roughly equivalent to the California code. So you're getting a sense basically that the national codes are approximating a zero energy ready home enclosure. You're pretty much there. And it's a 49, 38 attic, depending where you are. It's a 20, 20 plus five wall. It's 19 or 30 in the floors. The basements are 15, 19. None of these um, quantity of insulation levels should be surprising anyone. They're easily achievable. Uh, a zero energy closure is very, very much uh, not that difficult to target. So this is the code over time. And from two and from 2006 IECC to 2012, there was almost a 40% jump and then another significant jump down to 2021. And all along, we've been getting that increasing risk that I talked about that we have to address. And the first risk is the moisture damage risk. And the reason that's a risk is in a lesser code, you have a lot of thermal flow and with a really good code, you have very little thermal flow and very little airflow. So you wind up with a lot colder surface inside the assembly, which means you have a lot more wetting potential in terms of this surface being colder and more likely at the condensation point. Meanwhile, a lot less heat coming through to dry it. So it just means you have to be bulletproof on keeping water out of the assemblies. And so your moisture control system is really important. How you control vapor and it's a basic uh, strategies for air sealing, air barriers that we discussed, and vapor barriers. But the bulk moisture, again, is where you have to be rigorous. You know, water managed roofs, walls, openings, foundation materials. And on the inside, we have to be more cognizant of keeping moisture under control. And so HVAC has to add humidity into the mix as well. So we have to really effectively address all these factors, you know, the quality installation, whole house ventilation, spot ventilation, and eventually we have to realize if we're warm and humid climate, dehumidification is not extra credit. In a high performance home, it's mandatory. And it's the basic strategies of draining water off the roof, the walls, the openings, the site, the foundation. We talked about these. We know these, the strategies are pretty clear. You know, the weather resistant barriers, the flashing details, uh, the poly liner under the slabs, capillary breaks, uh, between the stem wall and the footing and between any place water can kind of creep in 
granular fill below the slabs, all these things so we can get moisture away from the building. And that's a complete water management system. And so on the left, we see a roof meeting a wall without a kick out flashing. So the propensity to get wet is very high. If we have moisture in the wall and it's a high performance wall, we have much, much higher risk. So it's about being diligent. You put the kick out flash in. This is maybe an eight or $12 detail, but it, you know, we have to just be diligent. We have to be bulletproof. It's not forgiving to do a high performance enclosure and keep the moisture out. So the question then becomes, how do we further manage risk? What are our choices? Well, we can do cavity wall insulation, but then it better be perfect quality. If you're gonna do a cavity wall where insulation and sheathing on the outside and uh, drywall on the inside, you have to be basically perfect because you have a cold surface, you have fibrous insulation usually, and you have basically a situation where if the air can get through or vapor can get through the cold surface, risk. On top of that, if you do cavity insulation, you need a thermal bridging strategy. You could do advanced framing, which means you use framing, uh, uh, greater spacing two feet in center. You get rid of all the framing you don't need. You can stagger the studs like two by four studs and a two by six uh, top and bottom plate or two by six studs and two by eight top and bottom plate. Or you can do a double wall. There are lots of ways you can do a cavity wall. But remember, the thicker it gets, the greater the risk. And the more you got to be perfect, you got to make sure you're not letting vapor drive go through the wall assembly. If you're in a climate that's very dry, maybe your risk is less and you have this option uh, can be lower cost and maybe a, a solution for you. So what you do to manage the risk is then you put rigid insulation outboard and you put enough outboard so the surface on the inside is the temperatures above that condensation point. And so this thickness is dependent on the climate to keep this temperature so that anything that does get through, you're managing the risk because you've, you've eliminated the wetting potential. And that's why people put rigid insulation on the outside. But rigid insulation comes <clears throat> with its own risks. Now, rigid insulation can expand and contract and leave gaps. And so you, there are details how you do it so you make sure that you, you're going to manage it effectively. And inside, you can use your fibrous insulation. You can spray foam or flash and bat. In some cases, uh, if you blow closed cell foam, you can use the rigid insulation as a backer and eliminate the sheathing because the, the whole bonding strength of the closed cell foam is as good or greater in terms of the structural performance of a wall with sheathing. So there's that option as well. And then there's one of my favorite options is advanced wall systems like SIPs, insulated concrete forms, insulated concrete panels, precast concrete. Here, you have almost no risk because the entire cavity is in completely filled and solid with insulation. And so there is no pathway for moisture to get to a cold surface. So you know, this is simple, easy way to manage your risk. And I, don't, I, I, I always wonder why more people don't use this technology. And we'll talk more later about how you can reduce costs using these advanced systems. And then when it comes to the interstitial space in the, in the proverbial band joist, and we got to insulate the band joist, there are only two options for doing the band joist. The most predominant op option people choose is spray foam in the band joist. And I always wonder why people don't use a killer application for structural insulated panels, put a sip in the band joist. And now I don't need any window headers and door headers. I have a structural band around the perimeter that can take the load and I have an inside air barrier where I don't if it's open cell foam versus closed cell foam. So a SIP header is a great killer application for SIPs. And again, you have to make sure you manage the band drugs. And so it brings us to the windows. And the windows are like this big funnel for losing heat or gaining heat. And you know, here's a very great wall with a, probably just an energy star window. And you see, basically, you're undermining that really great attention to a <clears throat> high performance wall if you don't address the windows. So our choices in window are, we can do an energy star window, but it's only R3. It, it's really something we have to get beyond. We have to do better. 
Now, if we go to an R5 or R7 window, which is typically a triple pane window, the problem is, one, it's thicker, and that's because the extra pane of glass means you need a thicker extrusion, which means a whole different manufacturing set and much higher cost. And the second problem is that middle pane of glass adds so much weight to the window. Any good sized window results in needing maybe sometimes an extra person to carry and set it in the window opening. So it's, so it's again, uh, <clears throat> a situation where what you have to do is really think about both the higher costs for that thick triple at both in terms of purchasing it and the higher cost for labor. So it's been very difficult to get this in the market. Uh, but uh, we're going to get real excited real soon because the thin triple is coming. So it's the same exact extrusion as a double pane. So we don't need any separate manufacturing rig to, to make these windows. The inner pane is the same glass as you use in an LED TV. And it's essentially eliminates the weight problem and the extra cost for the extrusion problem. And the cost premium that I've been hearing is $1.50 a square foot, maybe $2 a square foot. And that's gonna be a real exciting uh, small cost to get an incredibly better value. We'll talk about that in a second, well, right now. So let's look what happens if we can move from an R3 window, an Energy Star window, to an R7 window, how much it changes your investment in the enclosure. So uh, there's a website I went to where it just crunches the whole wall, R value. I use 15% of wall area. These numbers would come out better as you get to 18 or 20% window to wall area, which most builders build with. But let's be conservative, go 15% wall area, and we're, we're, we're assuming a, a, a cold climate like climate zone five. And essentially, if I have an Energy Star U.3 window, an R18 wall, which is a six inch frame wall, you'll lose about uh, over a third of the value down to R11 with an Energy Star window. Now, if I go to a R39 wall, which is now like a 13-inch uh, a wall, and I still stick with an Energy Star 0.3 U-value window, I'm losing like 70%, 66%, two-thirds of the R value is being lost because the window is only an Energy Star window. So that big investment to go from a 6 to a 13-inch wall and I'm losing, I'm only getting a modest increase from R11 to R15 effective R value for all that investment. That's how important the window is. Now, if I use an R7 window with this six inch wall, my effective R value goes to almost 15, the same as with a 13 inch wall, just by making a better window. That's how powerful the window is. And we have to figure out that we got to get to these uh, the uh, triple glaze, much, much higher efficient window. And thank goodness for the thin triple. It will be in the market in the next year or two, and we're going to have choices to finally get there. Note, by the way, an R60 wall, which is like a 20 inch wall, I would lose uh, like 70% of the R value from 60 down to 17. Look how much little I get from a, uh, from a 13 inch wall or from a six inch wall. It's such a uh, under. It's such a big loss. The investment can never pay for itself. So it's a big deal for these windows. And notice, I almost with a six-inch wall get to the same as a twenty-inch wall when I use the R10 window, which will be an option with the thin triple. Very exciting what this class will do. By the way, this is what it looks like. Uh, uh, they use uh, Krypton gas instead of argon gas. Uh, uh, which now is available at lower cost and more affordable for the windows. And they also, um, again, have uh, really uh, taken advantage of this LED type glass for the middle section, which is really effective. So they'll coat uh, these inner and outer surface, and it's a really great window. So lastly, we have the foundation. We talk about the enclosure. I told you there would be a dog bark eventually. And uh, in the enclosure, the typical choice is a poured concrete foundation today. And uh, I always am amazed that this is the kind of the default, let's go to a poured concrete foundation. Uh, you could do concrete block in some markets, they still do that. And what you notice, you have the drain tile here. I added 
the lines for the uh, pipe going through the foundation every six or eight feet or so, so the water from the gravel can get to the, has a pathway to get to the drain. Uh, I have to build a whole extra wall off this assembly, uh, usually uh, another two by four wall for the drywall and insulation. It's a, when you add, look at the entire system, that's a pretty costly system. In contrast, I can do a precast concrete wall and essentially it comes with ribs. It uh, uses 70% less concrete. It has R10 insulation completely wrapping the entire assembly, even the ribs, and I have a nailing surface so the drywall goes right on without building the extra wall. Look at all the advantages of precast versus porting, uh, poured in place concrete. First, it's a much stronger wall. It's almost like having an effective one big bond beam around the entire perimeter of your house. And as a result, you have less cracking. Uh, moisture protection, you, it's made with 5,000 PSI concrete versus 2,500 PSI concrete. It's virtually almost waterproof as installed. You can put on the damp proof and just for extra protection. And you have that clear drainage path. Again, my water in the gravel goes straight through to the drain because there's no footing. It sits like a bond beam on the gravel. There's a bit of extra work because it has to be dead level. But once it sits on the gravel, now everything goes right through. And even the poly liner can go right underneath for both a capillary break and almost like a bib around the entire foundation. So great moisture protection. Cycle time uh, goes installed in one day. Put it in winter when you might have trouble due to cold weather and you can't pour. You have the integrated insulation, you have the integrated furring, so I don't have to build a frame wall. The dimensional accuracy is dead perfect, so again, less rework. You have absolutely level floors. I mentioned it's 70% less concrete, and because I'm not building that extra wall inset from the foundation wall, I'll add about 80 square feet per, let's say, 1,500 square feet of basement. So I'm always amazed that we don't use a more cost-effective way for foundations, but we'll there's even a more cost-effective way, which we'll address later. And last, oh, now the last part's a roof. And the most common roof we do is we blow in insulation in the roof. That's the most common. It can be cellulose, fiberglass. And uh, where I struggle with this is it's basically, um, it's not a six-sided assembly. The entire top side, about 45% of the insulations exposed without an air barrier. So I believe that really reduces the performance of insulation, particularly I've known in my own homes that the cellulose I've used has compressed quite a bit over time as well. I believe absorbing the humidity, something creates a real significant decrease in the thickness over time. Now you'll put in wind baffles on the edge, but like I said, you're still left with about 45% of your assembly without a topside air barrier. And so I think this is the default, and we have to put so much more in, I believe, because we don't have the topside air barrier, also because attics can be so much hotter in the summer. So it's, it's much more egregious interface between the ceiling and the attic. Now, the other option is to do spray foam up against the rafters, so now we create an unvented attic, and uh, this is uh, has a lot of benefits uh, because the airspace above now may be 80 in the summer versus 130. And so there's a lot of benefits to surface temperatures and how the house works. And then we can do advanced walls like SIPs as your attic. And again, I, I believe this is a killer application for SIPs. Let me talk later about why I think it's a killer application for SIPs. Don't forget with this insulation, I'm gonna still need an ignition barrier even though if it's closed cell, it's an air barrier. So there's some fire code elements you have to manage as well. So what are the cost savings for going to an unvented roof from a vented roof? Well, first of, my, first of all, you have a free optimized duct location and equipment location. So you can actually keep your equipment and ducts out of an unconditioned attic. And I believe because the surface temperatures below here and here are gonna be so much more managed and have better uh, uh, radiant surface temperatures for comfort, you can actually, I believe, go to a single versus a split system in homes with unvented attics. Also, you eliminate the cost for a ridge or gable vent and for your soffit vents. And you eliminate all the costs for all the air barriers at the attic ceiling interface. 
drop ceilings, raised ceilings, shafts with flues and vents, knee walls, recess lighting, wind baffles, and you eliminate all the air sealing, the entire footprint of your home you have to seal between the drywall and the top plate, that goes away. You don't need an insulated attic hatch, plumbing, electric penetrations, your duct boots. These benefits, I believe, add up to maybe a thousand or two thousand dollars, but I'd have to do some real serious number crunching, but I'm pretty confident this is a significant savings that can pay for the extra cost of the unvented attic. So with such a good enclosure, what happens is all the remaining loads for equipment, appliances, and lighting become a bigger portion of a smaller pie. So here's the energy used for a code home. Here's the energy used for a zero energy ready home. It's a much smaller pie, but, here, but here's the blocks for the lighting appliances and hot water in the code home versus a uh, high performance home. So they become from less than half to much more than half of the total energy use. So it's really important to get them efficient so the, it's a simple thing here, just to choose really efficient ENERGY STAR appliances, fans, lighting, heating, cooling, water heating, and use efficient water distribution, low flow fixtures. And the key thing will be, if you're going to go for zero carbon, all your choices here will have to be all electric. And uh, more and more, there are great choices to make that happen. On a heating and cooling side in a cold climate, there are cold weather heat pumps that are making uh, heat pump for uh, those climates, a much more viable option. The big challenge will be in water heating, you're really stuck with electric, with heat pump water heating. Uh, that's fine in single family homes if you can find the space for a heat pump water heater. In multifamily housing, you're gonna have to go to a central heat pump water heater, or that's one area where it can be problematic to get a efficient water heating. But outside of those uh, um, particular situations, Going all electric should be no trouble. These are the basic uh, lowest level you want to be in a zero energy house, basically energy star components. The second risk is uh, comfort in a high performance home. And the reason is you have so much less airflow and thermal flow going through the assembly. Your loads are reduced so much that you have much longer swing seasons, much shorter cycle times, for your cooling cycle because they are so easy to get to temperature and much, much less airflow. And the reason these are risks is in humid climates, shorter cycles and longer swing seasons mean you have a lot more risk of discomfort due to humidity and you have to have a dehumidification strategy. Uh, you can maybe get away a little bit more in the dry climates. In all climates, we have to we have more risk because we are not attentive to airflow design or duct systems are just kind of thrown in without the care and attention they deserve. And so we're gonna to have to be much more rigorous about the location of our duct systems and the design of the duct systems. And we all know the comfort drivers, temperature, speed, humidity, radiant temperature, clothing activity. These are the ones we can control. And the big advantage you have in a zero energy ready home is mean radiant temperature is dramatically better. You know, with all the thermal bridging and the control, with the extra insulation and air sealing, your surface temperatures throughout the house are dramatically better. You throw in that R7, R10 window, and it's amazing how your radiant surface temperatures are under control. And since radiant surface temperatures, mean radiant surface temperature, have 40% more impact on comfort, you can have a huge, huge uh, buffer before your feeling uncomfortable in these homes. Huge advantage. So it just means we have to be more attentive. We have to make sure we have mixing. We have to make sure we have dehumidification. So it's the basics of calculating the load, selecting equipment, uh, getting the duct systems right, and managing late load in humid climates. And we do that by checking airflow and charge and airflow with the registers and the exhaust. All these things have to be measured. That's the basics of a comfort system. Here's our humid zone, but that's not nearly enough. Virtually anywhere on moist A locations, anywhere you're, any place you're air conditioning, you, you're going to have to think about dehumidification strategies. So that's, that's my recommendation is go beyond the IECC maps for where they say the uh, humidity uh, is, control is mandatory. It's virtually everything in the humid climates. Anywhere you're air conditioning and there's potential for humidity, you have to have a dehumidification strategy. 
and it can be a standalone dehumidifier, a ducted dehumidifier, or there are some central variable speed equipment that have a dehumidification mode and controls that can make it work. The key thing that we like to point to is about the energy savings impact of the set point. If I set, based on some analysis we've done, the uh, relative humidity set point to 60%, it's 170 kilowatt hours per year in this one study. And if we reduce it to 50% relative humidity, it's 800 kilowatt hours a year, five times more energy use by reducing the relative humidity set point from 60 to 50%. So really, there's a, uh, I think we can be plenty comfortable at 60. You don't want to go much above it. So you do want homeowners to understand the implications of, of choosing one set point over the other. And really important in high performance homes is we got to stop the madness. We got to we, we got to get ducks and air handlers out of unconditioned attics or crawl spaces. It's about 10 to 45 percent additional thermal losses. I believe the effects could be even greater. And so we have to get them inside. Lots of choices how to do it in terms of ducts in conditioned space, uh, between floors, drop ceilings, modified trusses. We can insulate the crawl spaces or basements, and we mentioned the unvented attics. Lots of strategies, but you have to be there. You can't have a high-performance home and not do this. And the other options, get rid of the ducts or have trade ducts with a ductless mini-split system, or bury the ducts in a vented attic under the insulation. But my, by far, I'd love to see all builders doing zero-energy homes in this conditioned space or using a ductless system. And the last risk is indoor air quality. If there's so much less uh, airflow from inside to outside, there's much more risk of accumulating contaminants, and there's lots of opportunity to bring contaminants in our homes. So you need a comprehensive strategy, source control, dilution, filtration. Most of you know dilution under the name ventilation, high cold fresh air system, and high capture filtration is the name I like for filtration. So radon is one of the most significant pollutants to worry about in high-risk zone one locations based on EPA's radon map. And so all those dark red locations you have to worry about. But if I'm a, if I'm a zone two sitting here surrounded by all this zone one, I'm probably pretty much going to be interested in radon protection there as well. So I'm, I don't know how you can have little zones and stay, that are surrounded by zone one and not be attentive to the zone one recommendations, <clears throat> particularly because they're so easy to do. Now, basically, uh, first you're putting uh, a layer for collecting the radon gases, which is the gravel. Then you're gonna put a plastic sheet under the slab so you can't diffuse air through the slab and let radon gases permeate into the basement. Then you're going to seal and caulk all the cracks and, and your sump pump pits and everything so that, again, you're stopping the flow of uh, soil gases into the house. Then you're going to put a vent pipe with a stem in the gravel to collect the gases what, up through the roof and a junction box in the attic or somewhere where you can connect to a uh, powered fan where any radon test would reveal that you still had uh, concentrations beyond recommended levels. And the easy part about the system is you're already doing the first three, the, uh, the gravel, the poly, and the ceiling and caulking as a matter of your moisture control. So the only really pieces missing for a radon resistant construction is the P PVC pipe and the junction box. There's virtually no excuse not to have this in almost any area at risk of radon. Radon tests are recommended. Lots of times builders don't want to provide them because they are asking the homeowner to test if their home is really dangerous at a the time they're handing over the home to them. But it's a really smart thing to do, particularly because you're ready to mitigate any excess radon with the junction box already in place. Uh, the other thing you do to control sources is use materials with low chemical content, formaldehyde, BSCs, so press wood, cabinets, paints, carpets. There are loads of labels and ways to easily find these products. They are Absolutely, throughout the market, uh, a lot of times builders are already using these materials and don't even realize it. So a lot of times, all they got to do is verify it with these labels that they're getting 
low chemical content materials to reduce the source of contaminants. You also want to reduce biological contaminants, and that you can do by keeping dust mites out, and that you can do by keeping relative humidity at 60% or below that magic number we talked about earlier. So the dehumidification strategies are not only important for moisture control and comfort, they're important to keep dust mites from growing to the billions in our homes, in our sheets, in our carpets, everywhere throughout our home. And then you want to keep biological contaminants vis-a-vis -vis pets from entering spaces. So using screen vents is an easy, low-cost measure. The only place you don't do this is your dryer vents because that will collect lint and block the function of the vent, which is to get rid of the moisture from the clothes dryer. And then it comes to the fresh air system, the whole house ventilation. You have three options, exhaust only, supply only, and balance. I won't go into lots of detail. You, you get lots of good information about this and lots of training. Exhaust only is going to create negative pressure in your home. So you do not want to do this in a hot, humid climate. You don't want to be sucking uh, hot, humid air into the assemblies with negative pressure in the home. So it's not a right choice for that. It's good in dry climates and dry climates that are uh, possibly cold where you, you won't, don't have that risk. Supply only you don't want to use in cold climates because you don't want to push warm air into assemblies where they can reach potentially a cold surface. So supply only is good in a warm climate. And so you're pushing against the migration of moisture from outside inside. And balance is great everywhere. And it's more efficient when you have recovery. Uh, there are two ASHRAE levels or the number of ASHRAE levels, 2010 and everything past 2010 starting 2013. The big difference is uh, instead of 0.01 times the square feet of conditioned space, it's 0.03. So if it's a 2,000 square foot house with three bedrooms, it's 7.5 CFM times bedrooms plus one. So 7.5 times four, which is 30, plus 0.01 times 2,000 is 20 for 2010, ASHRAE 62.2 or 50 CFM whole house requirement. If you're using 2013, the difference is 0.03, which is 60 instead of 20, and 30 is 90 CFM. Almost all the labeling programs allow your choice of 2010 or 2013. So you'll, you can pick which level you think is most appropriate. What you have to recognize is if you're in a hot, humid climate, the more air you're bringing in for six, seven months a year is also introducing, in effect, a contaminant, moisture and you have to manage that moisture coming in. Uh, spot ventilation is really critical. The numbers are just basic. It's 100 CFM. If it's on off switch, if it's continuous, it's 5 ACH50. Research studies, studies I, I read and my best expert friends at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab would all tell you, you want a switch on higher level than just a continuous uh, in a corner. And the key here is if you get over 400 CFM on your intermittent system, your, your exhaust vent, your exhaust hood over your cooktop, if it's over 400 CFM, you need a makeup air requirement. And ballast and bathrooms have to be 50 CFM. And lastly, filtration, the uh, high MERV filter, hopefully moving to two, four inch, five inch filter racks is standard. Uh, eight MERV is the threshold for most Performance programs like Air Plus, I recommend 11 or 13. Just, it's just a great protection to have in the house. And lastly, solar ready. Uh, these are the areas where mostly it's required in programs like Zero Energy Ready Home is where you have five kilowatt hours per square meter a day or greater. But it's really encouraged everywhere to make a house solar ready because it's such an easy thing to do to make a house solar ready. Uh, it's simply a matter of giving the homeowner the documentation for the trusses or the roof framing so that they have evidence it can take a six pound per square foot load for the collectors in case they're put on the roof. It's also putting in one inch of conduit from the attic to the circuit breaker box so that there's a wiring path from the collectors to the inverter in case you don't have microinverters on the panels themselves. And then you have a dedicated area for the balance of system. You have a conduit into the box and lastly, some circuit breakers this is a very small, minimal cost way to make your house future ready. Okay, so we're from our sponsor. All that came from the Zero Energy Ready Home Program. Now I'm going to take you to content for how to get to lower zero for lower cost. This comes from what I do with retooling. 
I'm noticing my time's getting tight, so I'm going to move a little bit faster this section, faster than I'd like. But I, I hope what you get from this is not so much the, all the answers, but the concepts that are there for the taking with huge cost savings, and that of all the builders in the country that should be leveraging optimization, it should be the high performance zero energy builders. We want them to be able to deliver zero at lower cost. So where this came from was, uh, you know, forever traveling around the country, 80,000 miles a year, training builders and builders and builders all around the country, and finally moving into more rigorous requirements and thermal bypass checklists, and then getting on a plane and coming home. I finally got on a plane one day, right about 2009, 2010, and it was almost like a lightning bolt that I realized, what am I doing? I'm just getting builders to do Energy Star, and I'm seeing so much missed opportunity to build better homes. So I documented that in a book, Retooling the U.S. Housing Industry, which was great, but it was a first attempt to lay out a theory. It needed to be vetted. And so thus began an accidental research project, five plus years of working with builder executives at these workshops, vetting feedback, ongoing research, rinse, wash, repeat, next work workshop, next workshop. And it, it's led to this new substantially improved framework for optimization called I call Housing 2.0, should be published at the end of this year. Uh, real excited about how well this framework has developed. And I can't, couldn't be more grateful than the hundreds and hundreds of builder executives that came to the workshop because the exchange and the, and the insights were incredibly important to fine tuning this whole framework. So essentially laying this out is there are five key homeowner experiences. And it's, this is a consumer customer experience imperative right now. The informed customer is vastly better prepared and vastly more critical and using tremendous more filters. I would ask any builder to consider what their chances are of being successful if their reviews are at three or two stars compared to four or five star builders. We won't spend $60, $80 on a meal from a three-star restaurant compared to a four or five-star restaurant. And what's the chance we make the biggest purchase of a lifetime from a three or two-star provider? This is just a customer experience imperative. And the five key home buyer experiences are community design, performance, quality, and sales. This is a two-day workshop to really work through all this. I'm going to give it to you in about five or 10 minutes. But essentially, decades of traveling around the country I'm admittedly a hard judge. This is what I was seeing as the opportunity for builders. They were way low, where five is moving to optimization and zero is hardly addressing the opportunities. Most builders were barely addressing the opportunities. And all I'm, I'm doing with zero energy builders is moving them one bar. And that will not get it done. You have to deliver in all five experiences. It's like a five legged stool. Get one wrong. You know, deliver a house with a wet basement or horrible floor plan or a community you don't want to live in or a sales experience that's horrible. It doesn't make a difference that you're a zero energy builder. You have to optimize all five key experiences. And so the framework in its summary looks like this. Community, you have to optimize spaces, open spaces, quality features, and, and strategies for enduring value, the three concepts for each of those. Design, you have to optimize the site, you have to optimize natural comfort, you have to optimize space, right size in the right way, you have to optimize simplicity with architectural integrity, and you have to optimize integrated systems. 12 ways of doing that, just that one approach. Performance we talked about is building science, it's efficient components, indoor air quality, water conservation, disaster resistance, quality is about uh, quality assurance strategies, getting rid of waste with lean production, quality assurance is getting rid of defects, and best practices pro that provide better quality products, and the three strategies for each of those. And sales is about a whole process, the right message on the front end, the right press it, process during the sales transaction, and the right service after they buy your home. So all these things got to be done, and that's the part of the whole pie that you achieve with zero. It's a sliver of the customer experience. That's not enough 
to make the high performance builders the most successful. And all the opportunities kind of fall into these major buckets. You know, costs you can save by optimizing material space, the integration, quality choice, satisfaction, cycle time, productivity. We talk about all the ways to do that. And we optimize value by optimizing lots, site, nature, function, performance, quality, protection, experts, all part of that framework we just talked about. Let me give you some examples. Here are 2,000 2, square foot floor plans. Okay, one's 50 by 40, one's 80 by 25. But the perimeter of the rectangle floor plan is 210 linear feet, and the more square configuration is 180. So, if it costs me 70 bucks a linear foot to build a frame wall and 40 bucks a linear foot to build a foundation, that's $110 a linear foot for the extra perimeter. So with 30 extra perimeter fee times 110, that's $3,300 spent just on geometry. And I would promise you you're going to have more hallway in this configuration because it's then there's other wastes of space because of the geometry. You can have a much more compact circulation in a square floor plan. Uh, let's take another floor plan. Uh, I, I, I was observing a incredibly low cost affordable housing project where the footprint, uh, the, yeah, the footprint went from this configuration to an inset for a porch. And that costs you a lot because this wall here moves here. So that's equal, but it's a 12 by 16 porch. I have a 12 foot wall here and a 12 foot wall here that's new while I've lost 2,200 square feet and went from 2,000 to 1,800. So I'm losing 200 square feet and I have extra walls. So the added cost again is $110 a linear foot for the, fan, for the frame wall and the foundation. And I have 24 feet, 12 and 12 for the inset. So that's cost me $2,600 for 400 less square feet, 200 above grade and 200 for the basement. Again, we have to think about this. And I could do it instead by investing the extra savings into a much nicer front porch. So we have to think about how we spend our money. Uh, optimizing space, right sizing the right way. And the two strategies for that are leveraging space by minimizing wasted space and enhancing space with all sorts of techniques that where you're reinvesting a portion of the hard cost savings to make the space live bigger. So you have a Basically, you're going to have homes that live better at lower cost. And the key thing here is that um, those are hard cost savings that can be applied to all the other things you want to do in the home. Uh, a lot of this comes from um, uh, lots of other good thinking. This the most uh, prolific on this concept is uh, Sarah Suzanka. The not so big home books are amazing. Uh, I think. We have a kindred spirit in how we think about this, a lot of the similar kinds of uh, recommendations. But the way you leverage space is, again, geometry, layouts, eliminating or combining rooms, minimal, minimal but generous circulation. So you don't want a lot of hallway, but the hallway you have, you don't want narrow. You want it so it's more comfortable. And built-ins are an incredible energy efficient feature because they enable spaces to be living much bigger at a much smaller size. And then enhanced spaces with indoor outdoor linkages, a house just feels better when it connects to outdoor spaces. And outdoor, outdoor spaces cost a fraction of the indoor spaces and often are incredibly better experience for the homeowners. They love living in their outdoor spaces. Changing ceiling heights, high quality finishes, trim and features, effective use of colors, lighting, natural and artificial. These are all are techniques that work. Uh, I'll walk you just through one floor plan I did 35 years ago uh, for a project when I was in California. It's only 1,480 square feet. It has an open layout to feel bigger. It has hardly any circulation to get the most out of the square footage. It's got built-in furniture almost everywhere. So it lives big. I mean, every room has got storage. There's no clutter. Clutter will make a space live smaller. If you have no clutter, it's like you're doubling the size of a space just by doing that. I like using SIP, so I have a SIP roof, so I have slope ceilings in the front and the back and a flat section for all the mechanicals upstairs, and then outdoor indoor linkages to all these outdoor spaces that cost hardly anything compared to indoor spaces and make the house look completely different. And so if this 
1,480 square foot house lives like 2,000 square feet, which I would challenge anyone to look at it. I mean, look at the size of the master bedroom, the master suite, bath, showers, separate uh, room for the uh, commode, two sinks. Look at the split bathroom for the two bedrooms here, bedrooms with desks and uh, floor to ceiling dressers and shelves. I mean, there's so much storage, a big laundry room. Look at the size of the kitchen. This is only 1,500 square feet by optimizing space. And if that's 500, 520 square feet times 100 square feet, I've just extracted $50,000 of savings I can put into, again, better finishes, better color, better landscaping. Again, there's huge savings to be applied. Now, remember what I said about the unvented attic, how you can save money doing that? So if I have a typical framed house with a truss roof and a basement, I can instead do a, a shallow frost protected footing with a SIP construction and a SIP roof and trade off my basement for an upper level. Anytime I'll take an upper level uh, compared to a below grade space. Daylight not being uh, uh, against the basement walls and floor. This is a far superior space. And what's happening is I'm saving anywhere from $800 to $6,000 in the foundation, let's say an average of about three to $4,000. That unvented attic is going to save me $1,000 to $2,000 on all the air barriers, on the, on the ventilation, on the ridge vents and the soffit vents, on all the air sealing details. On uh, There's just a whole host of savings from doing the unvented attic. And I don't have to build this wall around the perimeter to finish the basement. I already have the walls. I just got to put on the drywall. So it's Tremendous cost savings. I have a higher value space. I have less risk because the shallow frost protected footing in expansive soils will perform much better, and I have lower utility costs. So every time my friends tell me SIPs cost too much, I say because you're not doing a fair comparison. If you want to look at SIPs, really do an apples and apples comparison. Just trade off one volume for the other that you're getting for free when I do that SIP roof. I'm not a SIP advertiser, I'm just a guy looking at my options going, why are we not doing this as a way to reduce cost? And then you just got to be absolutely in, insanely dedicated to optimizing all your systems. This is how much framing was being built in a project before it was redesigned to be optimum framing, and it saved 42% on the frame. And notice one of the tricks, it got rid of the whole uh, band joints. They just went to a top joist and ran the joist across from the other walls in this multifamily project. And then they wound up having 16% increase in the wall insulation R value because of the reduced framing. And then they reduced their sheathing 25% because everything's on a two foot grid. There's no cuts in, on the vertical uh, spacing of the sheathing. So all that waste was gone. So we'll talk more about this project later. This is done by one of my favorite heroes in the optimization world, Mike Steffen from Lowe's Construction. So more about this project in a moment. The other thing is we got the, we can, op, we can optimize our plumbing systems if we just think about them in the layouts. Here's a typical house uh, because bathrooms are here and the sinks here and the laundry's here and the bathroom in this corner, I'm gonna have to run piping around 75% of the floor plan. Another thoughtful layout by one of my favorite architects, Betsy Pettit, there's the plumbing configuration compact. This happens to be the zero energy house at the National Institute of uh, Standards and Testing in Gaithersburg. And the NIST home only has 12% versus 75% area for plumbing. Gary Klein estimates that by going to compact layouts, it's about a $2,000 saving potential on plumbing, just by calculating all the plumbing materials and the labor to install each piece. The other thing we can optimize is solar systems. Putting solar on a roof is both uh, more costly and less attractive. If we design solar so it's integrated in the design, it's just better looking and there's a lot less cost. And the reason for that is in addition to appearing better, I'm gonna get daylight coming through the first floor. So the first floor is gonna have more daylight. I'm gonna have less maintenance because when I have to replace the roof, I've got to pull off the solar system to put them on your roof. And I have cost savings because I don't have to put in sheathing, underlayment, roofing, or rack for this solar system. It goes right on the framing. 
it kind of is a, amazing how that all adds up to huge savings, let's say about two to three thousand dollars. And it looks better. Here's a solar system on a rack on the roof, and here it is as the porch. And looking from underside, you see how much more daylight you get. It looks great. You experience the solar, even though you can't see it normally as you would sitting under the porch if there was roofing below it. In every way, this is a better experience and it costs less and it's better. So why don't we do this? Uh, my time is really getting late. So I, I think I'm gonna skip some concepts and try to get to the wrap up here. You're getting an idea of what I'm trying to do. Since I'm over time. Uh, essentially what I wanna get across everyone is there's a huge optimization opportunity in the housing industry that's not being addressed. It's to varying degrees by all the builders and we can extract cost savings and added value at a huge amount. On the community side, my calculations when I look at the entire framework and I look at experiences converting C locations to A locations, there's 30 to $200,000 per lot of savings. And the big savings come when you optimize views and trees and urban spaces. On the design side, you can do significantly less square feet in integrated homes that live better and save about fifty to eighty thousand dollars. And these are based on four to four hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar home as a base case. And on the performance side, the superior high performance home features provide comfort, health, and durability that you can't count. But just the energy savings over thirty years can add up to twenty five thousand to more than a hundred thousand dollars. And the health benefits, I believe, are going to extract huge value increases as we go post pandemic. And then quality, less cost for labor materials, rework, waste removal, customer service, uh, lots of great studies by Scott Saddam and uh, uh, Glenn Cottrell at Ibicus, uh, 20 to $100,000 they'll see routinely for optimizing quality and optimizing lean. And the sales side, if we just are more effective delivering a total sales experience, our costs for marketing go down, we build a brand, at least 10 to 20,000 per home of benefit. So on a 400, $450,000 home, I can tabulate up to 100 to $250,000 of savings. What I love is when I see it actually happen in real life. And I mentioned my new hero, Mike Steffen with Walsh Construction. He built his first building on a site and then he said, we can do better. So for the next building that was the same type of multifamily housing project, the same customers, and the same specifications in terms of what they had to provide, they with a total optimization strategy, not even counting the site and sales and some of the other benefits that I, I go after, 39% below the cost of the first building just by optimization. And he was amazing at doing the optimization. What he redid, what he did after that was reinvest 8% of those savings to then take it to Passive House. So he built Passive House with a 31% savings compared to the first building that was just slightly above code. This works. So this is where what I wanted to cover. Um, I love zero energy, but I'm just as excited about getting zero energy builders to be optimized builders. I hope this makes sense. Thank you so much for spending the time. All right, Sam, thank you very much. And uh, we've got a number of great questions that have come in from the audience. So uh, if you're okay with uh, with helping some of our audience members with their specific questions and issues, that would be uh, fantastic. Let's go ahead and start with uh, Amy. Amy had a question. Um, uh, do the economics of solar hot water begin to make sense again? I think Amy's asking a great question. You know, um, I'm endlessly frustrated that we're going all in on solar electric and ignoring solar hot water. I think it makes lots of sense, particularly if I'm looking at, um, if I have to go all electric and go hot water, um, I really like solar maybe even more so than the heat pump water heater. Um, the big thing though is we need a low cost solar hot water system. Um, I've been working on some designs where you could take a solar water heating system off a truck, make much the way you would a air conditioning compressor, drop it on a pad and just hook 
in the cold water in and the hot water out. So all the builder has to do is provide the cold water stub and the hot water return stub, and then you put the solar system in with no field installation. The crazy thing, I think, is we always put the hot water, solar hot water on the roof. And to me, why are we putting an appliance on the roof? It's just like an air conditioning compressor. I don't want it on a roof. And so it's a solar wedge. It's completely made in a factory, and it can be made to be any type that's uh, aligned with the climate. You know, in a, in a cold climate, you have to have freeze protection, and very warm, you would not. So anyway, um, I, I think there's a whole opportunity for solar hot water. But the first thing I love to see the industry do is, is look into the opportunity because I, uh, for low cost solar hot water, the system that I'm looking at, I believe can be done for below $2,000. It's less than a heat pump water heater and still give you about a 60% solar fraction. So that's a huge, um, that's a huge opportunity. But even on the rooftop, I think solar makes sense in a lot of climates for hot water. Got a question from Robert. He wanted to know if you could address the differences in bat insulation performance rating versus closed cell foam performance ratings. Well, the first thing I want to say about um, fibrous insulation is that everyone should pay attention to wood fiber insulation. Uh, as we're all looking to go to low embodied energy, uh, wood fiber insulation virtually is going to be one of the real exciting choices because it, made of wood, it means it's, it, it's carbon neutral and it's very high performance. But among the various bat or blown in fibrous insulation choices, they all work roughly the same and they all work very well if they're installed with no gaps, voids, compression. So it's really a matter of what can you do to ensure consistent installation. So I like better than bats where I have to rely on quality control on fuel crews that are not paid enough to do quality installation of bats. I like to blow in the fiber blow in the cellulose or the wood fiber insulation. We had a question, um, you were talking earlier about uh, relative humidity and uh, the, the, there's two people actually who asked, um, what are the mold or health impacts of 50% versus 60% relative humidity? Doesn't 60% start to really increase the mold and the fungi? No, no, uh, you, you, could be, uh, you can even be significantly above 60. Uh, 65 is where, personally, I'd start to worry because you, you're teetering on where you can potentially have problems. But particularly in a high-performance home, um, I know you don't want to get too you, you don't want to get too high in humidity because the again the wetting potential is greater. But essentially, you're not going to have mold at 60% or 65%. If you look at all the research graphs and the things you've got to do to get mold to happen. Usually it's happening at 70%, 75%, 80%. It's much greater. You'll be great at 50, you'll be great at 60. You'll probably be just fine at 65. You don't want to go much above that. Speaking of uh, hazards, uh, Marty had a question. Uh, what about the danger or hazards, um, are there any, of running that radon pipe through the living space? Well, PVC is virtually, uh, and there's no diffusion through it, through it, and there's no air leakage through it. It's so well, it's so easy to seal tight. I have zero concern about that. And again, the air is, uh, particularly if you have a radon fan, it's moving through so fast, it's, it, it's not going to have any pathway in the house if you do even the basic amount of quality control. So PVC is, is um, piping is just fine. You, no need to worry about that happening in the house. Uh, Michael had a question. He wanted to know if you could explain, uh, can you explain an efficient window that also has solar gain? Uh, well, it's effectively the efficient window that has solar gain is going to relax a little bit of the uh, coating on the window so that the light transmission is greater. <clears throat> so you'll, you know, you're, instead of having a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.25 or 0.28, you're trying to get up to 0 0.45, 0 0.50. So you're getting more solar heat gain coming through and they can up the performance by again, having triple glaze windows and having um, good inert gases in between the panes, uh, good details on the frame. 
So uh, it's just, there's certain windows that are designed to let in more uh, solar heat gain uh, for passive solar homes. And that's just a, uh, you know, just uh, uh, option from some manufacturers, not a lot, but that, that's a window option you have. So there, in certain cold climates, you're looking for solar heat gain, you'll go with that window. Speaking of windows, Sam, um, I had a couple of attendees uh, mention a window from Alpine that is an R11, and they were claiming that it is a triple pane. Can you can you talk about that product a little bit? Not really. Uh, I don't know the details of that product. I know okay. that the two, there are two companies that LBNL is working with uh, to introduce um, the um, the thin triple, and that's not one of them. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I had a question for you. Um, do the dehumidifiers, you were talking about dehumidifiers earlier, do they work well with homes that use ductless heat pumps? Like those two can work together just fine? Well, so de you won't have an inline dehumidifier. You'll have a separate, a whole house dehumidifier dedicated to itself. But um, there are inline dehumidifiers that work great with traditional ducted systems. Ductless nice splits uh, will have to be paired with a, uh, a dedicated dehumidification system. Okay. Um, I wanted to move to um, a couple of other uh, topics. Uh, one, uh, let's talk about the structural for a second. Um, Andre wanted to know, how do I make a cathedral type ceiling with a ridge beam resting on gable end walls while also using SIP roof panels that are solar panel ready? Well, the solar panel ready part just means that they can take six pounds uh, of live load. Uh, so that doesn't really have anything to do with it. I think essentially you have to have the ridge beam, as he's saying, going to gable ends where you have columns holding up each end of the gable of the ridge beam size for the load. And then the SIP panels just basically span the ridge beam to the wall. So, uh, and there might be intermediate ridge beams depending on the span that are needed as well. So essentially it's, it, it's just a structural, uh, you know, it's just, they're building a structural frame uh, for the SIP panel that's indifferent to the solar because the loads are so light. I, uh, again, my recommendation is do the solar as a front or the back porch where you can get good enough orientation to have that orientation be effective. Okay. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about um, appraisals. Uh, Reed had a question about uh, um, addressing any issues with regards to the appraisal process for zero energy homes. He said that, uh, you know, we just got turned down because the appraiser was inexperienced with high performance values. You know, appraisals is an uh, evolving uh, situation. We just got a complaint letter to Zero Energy Ready Home because the builder built his own Zero Energy Ready Home and then it appraised so much higher that his property taxes went up and he's really frustrated. And we had to tell him we're really fighting just the opposite complaint, that they, that they don't appraise high enough and therefore uh, during transaction, you have some complications. So uh, you'll hear it on both sides. And it's because, like I said, it's evolving and it's a market to market situation. What I, you know, what I always recommend is, you know, uh, my good friend Sandy Automatis has done an amazing job really training up the appraisal infrastructure on high performance homes and zero energy homes. And there's a growing army of appraisers that are certified green appraisers uh, that are knowledgeable and actually do a good job assigning extra value. It doesn't mean that you don't run into an appraiser who is not qualified. So what you have to do is realize that you have the right as a home buyer, purchasing a home that's gonna be appraised to uh, tell the lender that you want a green appraiser. And uh, uh, green appraiser, of course, is uh, 
passes the course and the test, uh, usually by the appraisal uh, institute. And so now you have an appraiser who's informed and better capable and much, much more likely to give you a value that represents the benefits of the zero energy building. So uh, you have to be diligent. You have to ask for the green appraiser and say, look, my home's certified. It's built with all these advantages. And therefore, this is the kind of appraiser that I demand for this project. Um, one or two, I mean, it kind of ties into appraisers a little bit or appraisals, and that is existing buildings. We talked a lot about new construction here, but um, can you talk a little bit about resources for retrofitting existing buildings? Um, you know, obviously air sealing is something that is very uh, significant and has an impact, but but what else can we address when it comes to the topic of existing? Well, that's a great question. I'm very excited that one of my uh, pet projects that I uh, began when I uh, started DOE is the Building America Solution Center. And about a year, year and a half ago, we opened up a whole taxonomy for existing homes. So if you go to the Building America Solution Center, uh, it's got tremendous resources. And for those that are not familiar with the Building America Solution Center, it's designed to make building science actionable. So uh, the first tab has scopes of work. So if you need to specify an existing home, uh, high performance improvement, you'll have the scope of work you can use. Then there's a description that explains step by step how that measure is installed. You have CAD drawings to put into architectural drawings. You have images right and wrong that show how it's installed and how uh, how properly and what it's what is the incorrect way of doing it. Uh, sometimes you have videos and presentations built into the training part. You have all the references to that measure and all the codes and above code programs, and you have case studies to document how it's been done. So the Building America Solution Center is a great resource for new and existing construction, but the existing uh, section of the uh, resource is the newest and it's loaded with great content. So my recommendation is uh, go to your favorite search engine, go to building America, just type in Building America Solution Center, it'll pop right up. Last year, I believe we had 840,000 paid views on the Building America Solution Center. So it's a very, very uh, well-recognized resource for the building community, new and existing. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, ventilation and HVAC again. Um, so Marty had a question. If, if single HVAC becomes a better choice than split systems, is the industry going to create smaller systems with variable blowers and MERV 11 filters? I believe they already have. I mean, there are a number of amazing new products out there that can go down to like 5,000 kBTU for heating, um, you know, three-quarter... A ton cooling for whole house air conditioning. So, you know, you have a lot of uh, new entries into the market that are recognizing a high performance home needs a, a, a new type of equipment. And a lot of the mainstream manufacturers are following suit with smaller size equipment as well. So lots of good choices. And of course the variable speed equipment and uh, 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 is out there as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're in great shape in terms of having a lot of choices. The ductless mini splits are well suited to uh, high performance homes as well. So, um, so a lot happening that I think is going to make it easier because comfort is a bigger challenge with a better enclosure. All right, got a, you know, I got a question for you, Sam. Uh, it's it's from me. Um, I, I once had an HVAC professional tell me that oh, you you don't want to put a higher MER filter. Uh, in their in your air handler there because it's going to put more stress on it. It's going to cause it to have a shorter lifespan. Is that a myth or is there any truth to that? No, he was right under the conditions that he was um, talking about. If you have a thin, uh, like three quarter one inch filter rack, and you're putting in a high mer filter, uh, it could block the airflow through it enough that it really strains the system and can do some significant damage and freeze the coils and all those things can happen. 
what happens though is in high performance homes you put in thicker filter racks usually four or five inches is what we're looking for uh, but if you were to stretch out a one inch filter it might go about six or eight feet and if you stretched out a four or five inch thick filter it would stretch out like 40 feet and has so much surface more surface area that the ability to maintain airflow while capturing the particles you're that is the goal of the filter in the first place, uh, works so the whole system operates properly. So what he was saying, he probably had a one inch rack and essentially he was worried that the high merge filter might strain the system and that might've been true, which is why if you're a high performance builder, you, you really gotta be diligent about high capture filtration and put in the thicker filter rack so you don't have to worry about that. And a lot of filters are designed for the right airflow now. Gotcha. Okay. Good to know. Um, Amy had a question. Uh, we're going to talk about ACH50 for just a minute here. Um, she wanted to know, do you think that there should be a negative and a positive blower door test for that one and a half ACH50 across the country that you talked about early in the presentation? I don't know what she means about a negative and a positive, but just the, the regular blower door test is um, all you need to verify that you got to that one and a half ACH50. <clears throat> so um, you have the choice of either, <laughs> excuse me, pulling air into the house or exhausting it out of the house. Maybe that's what she's referring to. But whatever blower door, blower door test pre preference you have, the, out, no, the outcome that you're after is still the same. You want to verify one and a half ACH50. Okay. I um, wanted to put out the last call for questions from our audience. I've, I've still got a couple here, Sam. Um, you, you talked about an ACH 50 of one and a half and, and the whole country should be using that. Then why then do we still see state and local jurisdictions or code committees going with much higher numbers like five when the model code is even at three? You know, I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, you know, like I said, I just think, you know, if you ask a homeowner, how big a hole do they want in their in their enclosure, in their in the in, in the in the walls that surround them, how big a hole do they want? Do they want a one foot hole, a six inch hole, a two inch hole? They probably say they don't want any hole. And really this shouldn't be an argument. No one wants to have, if you do the equivalent leakage area for uh, five, three, or one and a half ACH 50, you know, no one would want a hole that big in their homes. So the trouble more than the code officials, how we think we talk to the consumer. I think we just have to be really in their level and in, a, in terms that they understand. No one wants a hole in their house. And that's all at one and a half ACH 50, we're getting it down to a few inches and that's the way it should be. So, um, you know, what I, I what I tend to do with consumers is open up a window and say, tell me when you, you know, when it's how big a hole you want. Of course, they want me to shut the window and have no hole. So, uh, uh, so that's, and more importantly, the, the technology, the, uh, the skill infrastructure to do one and a half it's all out there. And if we were to use advanced systems like, let's say, SIPs, uh, you have to, I don't know that you can get SIP walls that leak more than one or 1 1.5 ACH50. I mean, you have to work at it. So I, I just think it's, it's just, it's time just to recognize this is where the industry is and just to codify it. Okay. We are getting some uh, additional questions come in here on the final call. Eric has one. Um, he wanted to know what recommendations or concerns you might have for flat roof buildings in a temperate climate without HVAC. Without HVAC. Correct. Okay, I, I have to admit my bias. I don't like flat roofs. I don't understand why, for so many reasons, why you would build it. The purpose of a roof is what? It's to drain the water so it can leave the building. And um, you know, a flat roof's not really a flat roof, it has a slight slope, but you, you're just asking for more maintenance 
Also, if, you live, if you've never lived in a flat roof house, I'd recommend you go walk in one during a rainstorm. And it's sometimes it's amazing how much noise comes through. Uh, it's you know, the, 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 the sound is transmission is pretty high. So uh, I just, again, believe that you're asking for trouble. You're asking for more maintenance. Uh, it's just roofs should drain, slope them, and they look good sloped anyway. So uh, I'm not for that. I know a flat roof over at, uh, an existing condition space for a balcony. I know it always leaks. And, uh, and so I, I always call that a design failure. If I have a flat roof over a living space for a balcony, that it should be cantilevered off or built like, built like a balcony. So again, my, that's a personal preference. This is not DOE. It's, it's just me saying, I believe roofs should be sloped. And you'll, and you'll be a better consumer experience. And I'm all about the consumer experience. Okay. Got a question from Scott. He wanted to know if there is a difference between styrofoam rigid insulation, um, he, he typically sees this in like track homes, versus ISO board with radiant barriers for walls and roofs. Uh, There's a big difference. Polyisocyanurate board is um, is about double the R value. It's about six per inch, not double. It uh, regular polystyrene, um, extruded polystyrene is about five per inch. Um, uh, expanded polystyrene is about three and a half per inch, and the polyiso is about six. The other thing with the polyiso, if it's got a form. And it's got a foil face, it means it's also uh, vapor impermeable because foil's vapor impermeable, so it can dry to the outside. So uh, it just means you have to make sure that you're able to dry one direction to the inside and you're okay. But uh, so there's a big difference in R value, in drying potential through the assembly, but uh, you know, that, that's. It's also a big cost difference also between polyiso is a lot more expensive than polystyrene and expanded po uh, polyurethane. So there's lots of choices, but, but mostly it's the R value that people look at. Young Kuhn had a question. Um, how do you deal with kitchen hood exhaust and fireplace ventilation? Kitchen hood exhaust, fire place ventilation i think he's i think the question is how you deal with kitchen hood exhausts when they're in rooms adjoining an open uh, they're open to a family room with a fireplace and it's a good question because you don't want to suck the um you don't want to suck air down the chimney into the house uh and contaminate the house which is why you want airtight doors on a dry, on a fireplace and uh, to avoid that. But generally, it, it's, I think most codes require that you have to have a uh, airtight doors anyway. So I'm not sure how big an issue it is. But uh, if you're in an older home, existing home, and you have an open fireplace, you got, you have to really make sure you have that makeup air and it's a really risky proposition having a fireplace next to a uh, range hood. Uh, real quick, uh, Sam, I wanted to take a question from uh, Jeff. He wanted to know where we can get updated info for the 2021 IECC so we can see what's coming. Uh, Jeff, you're gonna go to the ICC's website, which is www.iccsafe, as in S-A-F-E, dot org. And they're going to have um, uh, the the code uh, as it's being finalized. Um, it's going through an appeals process right now, but you're going to be able to find um, a litany of documentation on there. All the proposals that happened in the cycle last year, um, what got voted in, and uh, that's that's going to be a great resource. Is iccsafe.org. Sam, did you have anything besides that? I just want to mention 2021's not yet published. Um, there's still some opposition to it, I think, uh, predominantly from NAHB. So um, 
I think that process has to work its way through before it gets published. But to, you are correct. You can get information about it and get um, um, a lot of information I have comes from the sources you're citing. So uh, you can get everything but the final document. It won't be published until that's resolved, some of the objections. Correct. Yep, that's right. Yeah, there's still some appeals that are uh, being heard, I think, later this month and maybe even early September. So um, so uh, the last question I've got here, um, and I apologize if I missed anybody's question. I don't think I did. But uh, if you have a question that you didn't get answered, um, the, obviously, Sam's email address is there on the screen for you to see. You can reach out and contact him with your question. The last one I've got here is from JK. Um, wanted to know, are there any prefab builder companies that you can recommend that deal with the many issues you talk about today? You know, prefab can handle many of the items, but it's difficult to find some who use some of these techniques, such as SIP walls. So that's a great question. I think there's some amazing new entries into the offsite construction world, and uh, it's gonna keep growing and getting better and better some very good companies. I'm, I'm leery of mentioning any for uh, fear of missing or leaving out some I should mention. So I'm, I'm going to just say, uh, if you do your basic, um, pick your preferred search engine and search on offsite construction and offsite zero to make it even more specific, you're gonna find some really great uh, products out there and I'm really impressed with the industry. My, my personal hope is to work with a lot of these offsite companies uh, with this optimization framework and just really put offsite on steroids, just get it so it's really, not only is it made uh, with all the advantages of a controlled environment construction, uh, but it's actually also built in, baked in with all this optimized design solutions as well. And I should reference that SIPS already is offsite. It's, or, you know, um, it's kind of a strategy for buying from a plant, so it comes and it's assembled in the field. So yes, there are some offsite capabilities to build a modular home with SIPS. That's just one more variation. But look, look consider SIPS as a prefab option. And when it comes to your site, some SIP manufacturers have assembly crews and actually our turnkey for giving you the entire enclosure. So I, I would add that as well. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Sam, for sharing your time and your knowledge with us again today. Uh, we had a great time last time back in April, and uh, this time was uh, fantastic once again. Thank you, sir. Hey, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry today was particularly busy with the background noises. So hopefully it all worked out and we had it always uh, loved working with you guys. Thank you so much. I want to thank also our, uh, our very large audience today for attending and asking wonderful questions. And thank you to Train, Goodman, DOE, Team Zero, and EBA for their generous sponsorship of this webinar. Now, as I mentioned at the open, this was the first in a five-part series of DOE webinars. We're going to be right back here again next Thursday, that's August 13th, at 2 p.m. Eastern, when Heather Ghosh will make her webinar series debut. We'll be talking about the full life cycle impact approach for the building sector. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy, and take care.